The name Smith Wigglesworth is legendary in evangelical circles and has become synonymous with faith. Probably more than any other person in modern church history, this humble British plumber was used by God to restore a biblical apostolic faith. This week from our ministry archives, we want to share some valuable lessons mentioned by the grandson of Smith Wigglesworth and also by one of his longtime ministry colleagues. The Jerusalem Channel is made with the support of you, our viewers. Thank you for watching. Shalom, I'm Christine Darg. As the coming of the Lord Jesus draws nearer with each passing day, we must stir up the spirit of faith. We're going to need strong faith for the days ahead to bring in the final harvest of souls and to endure trials. We can learn a lot about faith by studying the Word of God and the lives of faith giants, such as Smith Wigglesworth from Yorkshire, England, who was born in 1859 and died in 1947, just one year before the rebirth of the state of Israel. At the same time that God was bringing the Jewish people home, he was also stirring up the gifts of the Holy Spirit within the churches. Like our Lord Jesus, Smith Wigglesworth never received a university education, yet he is credited with being a great apostle of faith. After becoming a Christian at age eight in a Methodist meeting, he immediately became a soul winner. He led his own mother to the Lord. And Wigglesworth's wife, Polly, taught him how to read from the Bible, but he said he'd never read any other book. After receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit, his life was radically changed, and he developed a healing ministry that has influenced many of today's evangelists. Smith Wigglesworth originated the saying, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Now we're going to share some memories from his grandson, Leslie Wigglesworth, who was interviewed in Cheltenham, England, and a friend and companion of Wigglesworth, the Reverend George Stormont, whom we met in the United States. Ever Increasing Faith was the book title that uh, talked about Smith Wigglesworth's ministry, Ever Increasing Faith. And he believed that our faith ought to increase all the time because there was so much in God that we could have. And as we increased in faith, so God would give us his power. He felt, and he said to me one day, he said, the gift of reading is so precious to me, I keep it for the best book. I don't want to waste it on any other book. So he read only the Bible. He tried reading books, but he couldn't get anywhere with them. He read the newspaper, but said, I don't like reading the newspaper because if I go in, I come out dirtier than I went in. But if I read the Bible, I come out cleaner than I went in. And so he had that simple view that the Bible was sufficient, as it indeed is. And he would just uh, read his Bible, have it as a constant companion. He told someone, I'll give you five pounds which today would be worth about $8. I'll give you five pounds if you find me ever without some portion of the scripture. And I think the only time he didn't have a portion of the scripture was when he went to bed or got in the bath. All other times he had scripture with him. And he just lived by Bible principles. I think the simple fact was this. He learned, as we used to sing in an old song, to trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy or useful but to trust and obey. Perhaps more than any other teacher in modern times, Smith Wigglesworth insisted in believing the simple admonition of Jesus, only believe. One of the most famous sayings of Smith Wigglesworth was, I am not moved by what I see, I'm only moved by what I believe. He was also well known for another pithy statement, faith is an act. He always used to say, faith is an act. 
this is one of his expressions in every meeting, faith is an act. And through his ministry nowadays, people would always talk about the faith that Smith Wigglesworth acted upon. Faith is an act. And everyone now talking about him said what wonderful faith he had. Ever increasing faith in his books, ever increasing faith in his actions, ever increasing faith in his contact with God. And that's the kind of legacy he's left with us. He wants us to have the same simple faith. He so feared God that he feared no man. I think that was the fundamental uh, basis of his boldness, that he trusted God so implicitly and he revered God so deeply that he would never do a thing that would grieve God. And if God said it, then it's my place to do it. And no question, what man says doesn't matter. What man thinks doesn't matter. God has said it, I will do it. And I think that was the secret of his boldness. And I think that what, uh, the Holy Spirit developed by his communion with God, such a perception of God, that uh, his reverence grew, so his boldness grew. He would say, if you have to speak to the devil twice, he knows you didn't mean it first time. And of course, the classic illustration with Bigglesworth was he woke up one night and Satan was in the room and he discerned Satan there. Oh, it's you, he said, is it? And turned over and went to sleep. And that simple, complete confidence that the devil was a defeated foe and he had no risk at all. There was no danger from the devil. He told the story himself of how he was a in a city, saw a lady at the bus stop. She came out from her home, and a little dog followed her. She said, go home, darling. Mummy doesn't want you. And uh, it, darling didn't go home. Until at last, when the bus came, she stamped her foot and said, go home! And immediately it turned tail, with its tail between the le its legs and went. He said, that's how you have to deal with the devil. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are diversities of operations, but it's the same God who works in all of us. It's fascinating how the Holy Spirit moves differently in various ministries. And certainly in the ministry of Smith Wigglesworth, there were some very unique operations. John Carter was secretary of the um, General Secretary of the Assemblies of God of Great Britain. He was in Australia, Toowoomba and was in a conference, and the other speaker was the principal of a Bible, the Commonwealth Bible School, in, to, in a, I'm not quite sure which city. Well, this man's father was a Methodist preacher. He'd heard of Wigglesworth, and he came to check him out. He was suffering from cancer of the throat and had cancerous growths, and he was wrapped in cotton wool and flannel. It was so sensitive that he could hardly bear the touch of flannel or the bandage on him. And Wigglesworth said, well, what's wrong with you? And he told him, and he said, in the name of Jesus, and slapped him on the neck. And the man said to his son, I didn't feel a thing. And Wigglesworth said, now, tomorrow morning when you take the bandages off, you'll find no growths. And it was so. He was perfectly healed. So I often heard complaints about that. But you know, if the evangelist spat on the ground and made mud and slapped it into your eye, you'd be offended today. But Jesus did that. And I think sometimes we are too conventional and too proper and uh, don't allow for differences of method. One particular instance was a, a deaf and dumb man. And he came to Smith Wigglesworth in front of 2,000 people. And Smith went for his head and he said in the name of Jesus and that man began to speak first of all in a tiny little voice unbroken voice squeaky voice and then suddenly in a strong voice and the Lord healed him well of course he was subject to the powers that be in the meeting and so the meeting would start in its ordinary way and as soon as ever Smith Wigglesworth had a moment, he would invariably say, now, all who believe in prayer, put one hand up. All over the place, hands went up. All who believe in prayer, 
and God answers prayer. Put two hands up. Now, pray aloud. And everyone will pray aloud. And I, I, I see the present charismatic uh, exercises uh, as following this principle that he had. He always asked the people to always pray. And people were healed whilst they were praying, even before the ministry started. Well, afterwards he would just go onto the platform and take his little Bible out and give the word that God had laid on his heart. And it was always faith, ever-increasing faith, because God will give the more to us, the more we believe in him. And then, of course, he started to pray with the sick. And at times he would say, now today, we're having wholesale healing. You may have heard of this. And he would ask anyone who had a need to stand up. And so they would all stand up and they would pray for them. And as he prayed, people were healed all over the place. Quite amazingly, some were slain in the spirit of so-called today but uh, he had an amazing sense of God's presence with him. In mass evangelism it's almost impossible to lay hands for healing on all the people who turn up especially when there are thousands needing ministry. We have to trust the Holy Spirit to touch individuals and Smith Wigglesworth was a forerunner in this type of mass evangelism and healing. And it began in Sweden, where the um, authorities issued a ban that he was not to touch anyone, because they said he was healing without a license. And so he was banned. And the king of Sweden uh, get, sent a message to him, please do not touch people. I don't want you banned from this country. I want you to minister to my people. And so he was praying in one service. They had a big crowd. And Lord, he says, how can I pray for the sick? What can I do? And the Lord pointed to a woman who was standing. She was quite obvious, and she had some problem. He said, what's your need? And she said what it was. He said, put your hands where that pain is. And he said, I'll pray for you. As he prayed, the power of God dealt with that pain. She was delivered. And then he said, now, everybody who's sick, put your hands on the spot, if you can where the problem is, and miracles of healing took place all over the congregation. Smith Wigglesworth believed in using all the methods mentioned in the Word of God for healing, laying hands on the sick, anointing the sick with oil, and giving the command to be healed in the name of Jesus. I think he accepted more fully than we do, and we ought to do it, and it's a rebuke to me to have to say this, that Jesus said, heal the sick. He didn't say pray. And while Wigglesworth believed very strongly in James 5, 14 through 16, that the prayer of faith should save the sick, he also realized, and of course he read it so frequently, the Acts of the Apostles was a key book for him, that there's only one place in the Acts of the Apostles where they prayed for the sick, and that was the last chapter. In every other case they healed. Peter didn't say pray for the man at the gate beautiful, he said, such as I have, give I unto thee. And every case of healing, it was command, direct, it was imparted. And Wigglesworth uh, acted in the faith of that, that uh, it was not just a question of praying, but of healing. And um, he'd say, be healed, or go home, you're healed. Or um, I think one of the outstanding cases of that was the young man at a place called Chesterfield in Derbyshire. The pastor told this story to a friend of mine who told me, so I wasn't there at the time. But a young man came out for prayer with a bandage around his throat and a tube sticking out. And uh, he said, Wigglesworth said, what's wrong with you? He said, not my voice. I've got no voice. Can God do something for voices? Of course he can, unless he's forgotten how to make voice boxes. And he said, go home, you're healed and go and eat a meal of meat and potatoes. And the boy says, I can't. He says, don't argue with me, just do what God tells you. Next night he was back, still with a bandage on, 
Because they said, what do you come for? He says, to tell them what God's done for me. He said, don't need to tell me, you tell the people. He said, after the rebuke I had, I went home and I said to my mother, I want a meal of meat and potatoes. She said, son, you know you can't eat solid food. He said, the preacher said, I've got to. He says, and I want you to prepare it. And he said, my mother prepared a meal. He said, I took a mouthful and I chewed and chewed and chewed and chewed till I had to swallow and it went down easily. And my throat is, I'm perfectly healed. My voice is normal. Wigglesworth then, what's this tube doing in your neck? Well, he said, I've got to have it taken out. That's what I used to feed through. He said, what God's begun, he can finish. And he called the men and women around him, are leaders. He unwrapped the bandage. Then putting his fingers against the hole, he gently pulled the tube out. Then putting his fingers together over the hole, he said, now watch, you'll never see this again. And when he took his fingers away, there was no hole. And there was no prayer. He didn't pray once. He just healed. He ministered healing. Now that is faith. I think there's a tremendous verse in John 5. I think it's about verse 19. Where John says that Jesus did what he saw the Father do. And in John 8 it says he said what he heard the Father say. And I think that Lord Jesus spent much time in God's presence until he saw what God was doing. Then on earth he did what he saw God do. He spent time and listened to what God was saying. Then he came and spoke what he heard God say. And I think Wigglesworth's constant communion with the Lord meant that there are times when he saw God do the thing before he did it on earth. And all he had to do was to speak the word and it would happen. I think that was illustrated perhaps more vividly in the case of a lady, young lady, he was called to a house to pray and when he got there they said, you're too late, she's died. He said, I'm not too late, father sent me, he's never late. And he went to the bedroom, took the corpse off the bed, stuck the girl against the wall and said, death I rebuke you, in Jesus name come forth and she came forth. I got an interesting uh, illumination on that because I had a friend named Bishop Ronald Cody with the Apost uh, Catholic Apostolic Church and he was in New Zealand in 54, uh, in Australia rather, 1954, a place called Orange, New South Wales. And he read this in uh, Frodsham's book on Wigglesworth and he was so amazed he said to the, uh, the deaconess, Methodist deaconess who was helping him, Mary you should hear this. And when he read the story she said, I am that woman. And she had been sick. She didn't believe in divine healing. She wouldn't go to his meetings. And at last she said yes when they said, if we can bring Wigglesworth to the house, will you let him pray for her? And she said, God said to me, you kept my servant waiting, I'll keep you waiting. She said, I died. I went to the throne room of heaven. I saw Jesus on the throne. I saw light I can't describe. I heard music be one words. And then Jesus pointed to the door and I knew I had to go back. But I don't want to go back. You must go. My servant is calling you. Then I heard a voice say, death I rebuke you. In Jesus' name come forth. And I had to go. But I'm sure he saw that in heaven before he spoke it on earth. And that to me is where I, I'm frequently in prayer along that line that God will show me things before I go to meetings or speak into my heart things that he wants to say so that I will do in the meeting and say in the meeting what he once said. I mean, I don't plan. Wigglesworth had a wonderful saying, if you know what's going to happen in the meeting, you're backslidden. He did, of course, uh, believe very strongly in anointing with oil. In fact, uh, the first time he did it, he read it and he was so enthusiastic that he emptied half a pint of oil on the first lady who was prayed for. And the wonderful thing is she had a vision of Jesus and was healed instantly. But then he developed a more uh, acceptable method and he produced, invented a little oil bottle. It was like a little oil can that you squirt your cycle wheel with. It was plastic with a black base, clear plastic, and a little nozzle, and a, an oil-tight screw top. And all of us didn't feel, not one of us felt properly dressed if we didn't have a Wigglesworth oil bottle with us in those days. 
And he'd take his little oil bottle out of his pocket and he'd pour a drop of oil and said, now the unction's on you, brother. And he would then start praying and ministering healing. Smith Wigglesworth very wisely did not claim to have all the answers on divine healing. In fact, many times he continued to minister while suffering from sickness. After a terrible bout with appendicitis in which he was healed by God, he determined never to bring medicine again into his home. Jesus would be his great physician, but he didn't try to enforce his policy on others. He always impressed upon the people the need to come to Jesus and repent of their sins. Always. That was, that was more important than getting people healed. He was always happier when people were saved, as we should be too. And so salvation for him was paramount. Well, depending on the size of the meeting, you see, I've been with him when he's had a hundred in a meeting, and I've been here when he's had thousands in a meeting. And uh, usually he would preach short sermons, but full of meat and full of the Holy Ghost. And then he would begin to pray for the sick. And usually, it was under inspiration that he went to certain people and prayed for them. And then anyone else needed prayer and he would pray for them. And he would spend a long, long time praying for anyone who was in need. He was very strong physically. Well, he would say, now let's see what Father has to say. And then he would take out his testament, and this is the one, and give them a word. This is Smith Wigglesworth's own testament with his name on it and the insignia inside. And this is the one that he used hundreds and hundreds of times around the table at mealtimes. Breakfast, lunchtime, evening meal. He always had a word from the Lord, never short of a word from God. Wigglesworth was like Jesus in a very beautiful way. He had some characteristics that were unchristlike, but basically he was like Jesus. And he sought to be like Jesus and to do what Jesus called him to do and nothing else. We all would like to have great faith, but Wigglesworth had to grow his faith just like all of us have to. Some of the young men from the church went for a walk with Wigglesworth. And he loved to walk with young men and talk with them. And they asked him, how can we grow in faith or how did you obtain great faith? Well, it's like this, he said, first the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. And they discovered by what he said that faith is something that grows. And I think people have the feeling that he was either born with this faith or it was a very wonderful gift early on. It wasn't always so. Uh, his ministry of divine healing, of course, is the ministry that attracts people most. I wish there was more emphasis on his soul winning because to him that was more important. But um, there was a time when they had their meeting in what they called Boland Street Mission, Bradford. I believe that's demolished now. But in Boland Street they had this mission. He heard of people in Leeds, and I think Leeds is about nine miles from Bradford. and. Uh, this meeting on Thursday afternoons was for divine healing. And he went to see, saw miracles, began to take his people. Then one day, one of the leaders said, Brother Wigglesworth, you take the meeting next week, we have to go to a conference. He said, I can't. I've never prayed for the sick. He said, I can't do it. They said, there's only you left. And so he said, I found myself with the meeting. I remember when he told me this, he smiled so broadly because of what it meant to him. He said, I preach, and I don't know what I preach. But then he said, I said, is there anyone sick? And the first man down the aisle was a big Scotsman leaning on two sticks, and he hobbled down the aisle. He said, I didn't pray for him. I just touched him, and like electricity, it shot through him. He dropped his sticks. He began to stomp his feet, and he turned around, and he ran. He said, and I prayed for everyone after that, and everyone was healed in that service. Faith acted on leads to stronger faith 
and then you can act more. And that's how Wigglesworth grew in faith. And of course, he nourished faith by the word of God. And uh, you know Romans 10, 17. I think everybody knows that. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So he nourished his faith by daily reading the word of God. And then, of course, he used to interpret the scripture, uh, have faith in God in Mark 11, as have the faith of God, which is the marginal rendering. And uh, he believed that was faith that came from God. So he believed in a faith given to all men and then an impartation of faith when we asked it, God would give us his faith. And it was through the faith of Christ, as he would put it from Galatians 2 and 20, that he was sanctified. And through the faith of Christ, not faith in Christ, but faith that is imparted by Christ, that resides in Christ, and he gives it. That was how he grew in faith. I asked George Stormont if Wigglesworth ever talked much about a topic of great interest to me, spiritual warfare. I think mostly he did his own praying. I'm not sure that he would go along with some of the teaching on spiritual warfare that we have today. I personally don't go along with it all. Jesus never bowed any spirits over cities. Peter, Paul never bowed any spirits over cities. They prayed through and God dealt with the situation. Daniel prayed, didn't bind any spirit over cities or over nations. He prayed through and God sent angels to bind the spirits and to bind the princes. And I think that's the view he would possibly have taken. I mustn't try to put a view in his mind or in his um, repertoire because I didn't ask him on that. But I know that um, he believed that he had power to pray through and he had enough power to pray for other people. And though he I'm sure wouldn't say he didn't need other people's prayers. He didn't uh, count on them to the extent that some of us feel we have to. Well, God no longer has Smith Wigglesworth, and many of the faith giants of our present generation have gone to glory. But God still has you, and he still has me. Let's be strong, as Daniel 11.32 says. Let's know our God and carry out exploits. Amen. Meanwhile, I'd like to connect on social media or at our website, exploits.tv, where you can sign up for our free color magazine, Exploits. Also, we invite you to download our Jerusalem Channel app. And so until next time, always contending for the faith and praying earnestly for the peace of Jerusalem, I'm Christine Darg. Shalom and Maranatha.